Hi, we continue in Genesis 26 today with the third of the so-called wife sister story, story starting in verse 7 as you can see on the left side of the screen and as you can see on the right side of the screen I've shown the parallels between all three of them back in chapter 12 when Abram uh, lied to Pharaoh and the Egyptians and said that Sarah was his sister and then in chapter 20 when he spoke to the same king we have here Abimelech and Gerar as you can see up here and we'll compare those in just a minute and now with Isaac and Rebecca in chapter 26. Older scholarship is exemplified throughout uh, my videos here on Genesis by people like Klaus Westermann. Uh, see this as, quote, the most colorless and least original form of the three wife sister stories, containing, quote, blind motifs and clumsy repetitions, like verse 7. That's an example of what happens when you assume that there are different sources, that each of these three stories is basically one event um, copied or adapted from some, whichever one they think is the original of some oral tradition, perhaps, into these various versions of it. And so making some kind of literary comparison with people like Westermann are not trained in uh, denigrates this aesthetically as somehow less of an interesting story. But more recent scholarship has shown, as I've been trying to show throughout, that all of that denigration is misguided because it fails to understand how the final editors have woven this into a complete narrative and how each of these stories relates to the, each other. So rather than being a, a clumsy editorial uh, insertion, which parenthetically, and important to note in this time period, uh, often is a result of conscious or unconscious anti-Judaism by Germanic scholars who thought that the, the Jews were too stupid to cover the tracks of their editorial um, behavior here and that they could, these scholars could ferret it out. More recent scholarship, um, not enamored with that kind of anti-Semitic uh, presupposition, have been able to see these writers, as I've been trying to show, as uh, actually brilliant, aesthetic, creative people, uh, weaving together stories in their own ways, different than our particular forms of literary um, compilation, but fitting very nicely with what they intended to do. So we are certainly meant to know all three of these stories and to see how they relate, just as we saw in the last video, the uh, theophany from Yahweh to Isaac. Uh, similar to the one to Abraham is not just a doublet like it's one event but is highlighting that Isaac is now in the relationship with Yahweh uh, that Abraham has or at least Yahweh is inviting him into that we did not hear any response from from Isaac uh, as we looked in our last video so as we enter into the scene we need to be aware of some of the issues that I've been trying to cover from the introduction to the Jacob cycle and the introduction to chapter 26. I won't go back over them all again, uh, but one of those that's worth paying attention to is the timeline issue. To remind you, if you haven't looked at the others, that these are out of order, that everything we're seeing in this story takes place before the events that were already narrated about the birth of Jacob and Esau and the burial of, of Abraham, which is the last of the three to take place. So this imagines Isaac and Rebekah before they have uh, children, roughly 40 years after the time that Abraham and Sarah had been in the same place. Um, and an element of it that's really important that I've been looking at here is, uh, is this large chiasm from Michael Fishbane, which is why this piece is out of order to match the scene here in 34, the rape of Dina, which is in order. And as we'll see with the wife-sister story, there are a number of parallels, which is why it's a chiasm, uh, between the rape of Dina here in Shechem and the situation here. Both involve the, the question of sexual violence against a woman who's understood as a, as a sister in relation to a king. Uh, and there are other parallels we'll see, and yet the outcome could not be more different. The outcome of this story is peaceful, and the outcome of the story in chapter 34 is the opposite of peaceful. Um, so uh, we'll be noting some of those factors as we go. Uh, and as we look at the key words, I've noted, as a number of scholars have, that this third wife-sister story is really not about the relationship between the patriarch and his, the matriarchal wife, but about the patriarch and the king. And so although Rebecca is mentioned here and here, as you can see, woman, Isha, is mentioned six times in there. And as I've been trying to show the chiasm, I'll put it up here again, from 26.1 to 25, one of the interesting aspects of the chiasm is, although this paragraph is chiastically parallel uh, to the paragraph about wells here, using women and wells both as fertility symbols, interestingly, Isha for woman is six times in this paragraph, and um, beer for wells is six times in this paragraph. Um, those kinds of numerical parallels are unlikely to be coincidences given the importance of that kind of pattern uh, throughout Genesis, starting in chapter 1 and the first scenes, as I showed in the introductory videos about the uses of words seven times or numbers of seven times. Uh, but we can't know that for sure, but it is there, uh, whether it's intentional or not. 
So let's, with this uh, chart of the comparison up, begin to enter in our scene. And as we do, we note that unlike the first two scenes where Abraham, or Abram at the time, went to Egypt sort of out of fearful desperation in the course of famine, and similarly, Abraham here uh, is suggested that he's here, although not because of a famine, out of some desperation. In our situation in chapter 26, we said that it was Yahweh who told Isaac to uh, emigrate to Gerar and be there. Not to settle, though, and that's a key difference. So we see settling here using a shev, which is exactly what Jacob does in chapter 34, that sets off the problem. And perhaps that's exactly what the problem is here, which likens Isaac, <clears throat> and even more so as we see in verse 8, when the narrator tells us Isaac had been there a long time, to Lot in Sodom. And again, we'll see the great contrast between the, um, the situation of how the Sodomites confront Lot um, and his family and his daughters uh, sexual, with sexual threatening and then how the king of Bimelech and the Gerarites do here. Um, so why does Yahweh want him in Gerar? That's an interesting question in itself. When we look in the atlas, this is plainly a Philistine country, although the Philistines are anachronistic in the time of Genesis, as I've seen. If you're not clear on that, I'd encourage you to watch the introductory video, which highlights the suggestion of possible parallels with the David story, as we'll see today with looking out the window, parallel to Mishal and David in the window, but we'll get there when we get there. So why would Yahweh want him to be in this Philistine place in a city, given what we've seen about cities throughout Genesis, starting with Cain City, and then the Tower of Babel, and then with Sodom, all as a negative? Um, we can't know what uh, Yahweh's motivations are, uh, but certainly the sense that Yahweh said to camp there is suggesting a temporary expedient because of the famine. Uh, Isaac is not yet a farmer. He'll become a farmer as a result of this, perhaps precisely as a result of this, um, that as a result of lack of food, he's going to decide to grow his own, although we don't see any motivation given. We'll get there next time. Um, but what Yahweh seems to be suggesting is an expedient until the famine is over. Lot takes his invitation to settle there, and that's what happens. And so he finds himself parallel to Jacob and his sons in chapter 34 in Shechem. So this is how our scene now unfolds. And my note below suggests how the story is different than the parallels in the other wife-sister stories. Um, I've already gone over some of that, um, and we don't need to look at all that detail now. Uh, so we don't know how long he's been there yet. It's not until verse 8 that we're told it's a vague, long time. But now we hear this. The men of the place, the Anashi Hamakam here, twice in the verse, and we see that a number of other times as the source of potential violence of people defending their city against outsiders, asked him about his woman. And again, I'm underscoring that throughout, uh, throughout the Hebrew Bible, there is no word for wife. It's simply the word isha for woman, and hence I've translated it as woman throughout. So they asked him about his woman, and he said, she is my sister. Notice he's not telling her to lie. In contrast with the situation in chapter 12, where we saw that he said to Sarai, and you can see here, I know well you are a woman beautiful in appearance, and when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his woman, they will kill me, but they will let you live, so say you are my sister, so it will go well with me because of you, and my life may be spared. None of that is here. Nothing about uh, the question of their life at risk. Um, simply a lie. And there doesn't seem to be any immediate reason why. Isaac doesn't say he's afraid, although we hear it now. So the lie comes first, and then we hear the narrator telling us what's going on in him. For he was afraid to say, my woman, although thinking is not in the Hebrew. It's the narrator's omniscience that allows us to know what's in Isaac's mind. Although the narrator rarely uses that power. Again, we don't know what's in Yahweh's mind, and we didn't know what was in Isaac's mind in response of theophany either. So it's a rare uh, glimpse into Isaac's thinking. So he was afraid to say my woman or else the men of the place might kill me for the sake of Rebecca because she is attractive uh, in appearance and good looking uh, as she's described in 2416 during the wooing story. Um, so she's still good looking. Um, so we discover it's the same reason uh, that his father had, although we have no reason to think he knows that story. Both of these obviously took place before he was born. Although the one in chapter 20, parallel to Abimelech, as I was noting last time, raises some interesting questions about whether Abimelech might actually, in fact, have been Isaac's biological father, uh, a point uh, raised in detail by the, the description down here of the thousand pieces of silver that he gives to Abraham and declares that it's an exoneration before all 
who, you, who are with you, you are completely vindicated, suggesting that he's covering over the question of whether he was the biological father or not, but the doubt was still there. And so when he discovers, uh, as he will, that Isaac is the very son uh, that might well be his, wouldn't that be an interesting thing to know what's going on in his mind? Um, so far, we don't actually know that. We know that Isaac was told to settle there, um, and we haven't seen any direct relationship, so we're going to see it now. So when Isaac had been there for a long time, and as I note below, so the name is used only later in the verse from Abimelech's perspective. Um, the phrase for a long time is an unusual phrase here, Arku Losham Hayayim, here um, for uh, lots of days, among other things. But it's only in Ezekiel as a parallel, but it does make him parallel to, to Lot, as I noted here. Um, and uh, King Abimelech of the Philistines looked out of a window, and it's a couple of interesting things here. Um, is he looking out of a window, or is he looking into a window? Um, as let's see, as one of my notes here has, I think it's from uh, Miguel de la Torre down here. Yeah, here it is. Given the unlikelihood of Isaac fondling his wife in public, de la Torre asked whether Abimelech was looking out or in a window. And the biblical midrash um, is totally doubtful of this because, as I have my note here below has, it questions about having sex in daylight, which is something that the rabbis thought was just completely inappropriate. And not only in daylight, but in public. So that really suggests that that's not likely the case, especially if he's trying to cover up that it's his woman. So even though Raphael's painting here uh, shows it exactly as it seems to be described, uh, it certainly might well be that the, it's the king looking into the window rather than looking out of the window. And it also notes that Isaac and Rebekah are living literally in the shadow of the royal palace, um, much like perhaps Uriah and Bathsheba when David uh, looks across the roof of his house and sees his general's woman um, bathing herself or washing up um, as her, part of her monthly menstrual cleansing or perhaps offering a religious ritual when we get there uh, in that series, we'll look at that. Um, but it's certainly unlikely that this is happening out in public as Art uh, suggested. But we're certainly seeing from his perspective here, um, and he literally it's he looked down out of the window here. Um, the window, uh, Halan here, only the window of the ark elsewhere in Genesis, but certainly brings up the echo of Mishal and David um, in both these situations about, about the window. We can look at this one briefly in 2 Samuel 16, so you can see, as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Mishal, daughter of Saul, looked out of the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. And earlier, they also had a window situation where she, she covered him up um, from his, her father Saul's paranoid concern and let David down through the window, and he fled away and escaped. And so a m number of parallels about what happens uh, through windows. And so when Abimelech sees this, uh, and there's a lovely word play here, um, Yitzhak Metzashak, literally like a Yitz Isaac, Isaacing, his wife, um, and as we saw back in chapter 17 and 18, the many word plays on Yitzhak as, as laughter or making fun of or, or the sexual uh, issue uh, we see here. So having seen this, Abimelech called for Isaac. And uh, Isaac must be someone well known to him if he's literally living so close that whether the king is looking out the window or in the window, he can see enough detail to, to see behavior that says this is not your sister that you're doing this with. Um, so what does that say about Isaac's existing wealth and his power in this town to be a, a foreigner and yet be so close to the king physically? So Abimelech called for Isaac and said, Aha! Literally, Akhine there, something like, Aha, or lo and behold, she's your wife or your woman. Why then did you say she is my sister? And notice there's nothing about Rebekah here now. Now it's just Abimelech and Isaac and the woman. She, and Isaac said, Because I thought I might die because of her. Notice in my note below, unlike chapter 20, nothing is said about the absence of fear of God in this place. Um, and uh, it's simply just the fear of his own death. Notice that it's a passive voice. I might die because of her. Not that you might kill me because of her or your people might kill me. That would be a little too much. Um, so Abimelech responds, what is this you have done to us? And notice that cry echoes into all three. Um, so we, we see it here with Pharaoh. We saw it earlier um, with Abimelech. Uh, right here, and now we see it here. So Abimelech might recognize uh, in his repetition 40 years later, haven't I heard this before? Um, apparently there's no mention of Abraham in this scene, and Abimelech doesn't refer to Isaac by name. So we don't know that he knows that this might possibly be his son, um, but it's certainly in the air. 
So what is this you have done to us? Not to me, but to us, seeing it as a collective harm. One of the people, um, Achad Ha'am here, um, contrasting Isaac's concern with the men of the place, and it suggests that Isaac perceived them as more hostily linked with the place uh, than they actually are, which is an interesting aspect. The, both the previous situations suggested that that might have been so, but it's not here. One of the people might easily have lain with your wife using Shakoff, and only in the, so the Sodom story uh, previously, but used interestingly for Leah and, and Jacob in chapter 30, as we'll see. It's one of a number of ways of speaking of sexual intercourse in the Hebrew Bible, just as in English we have a number of ways uh, as well. Um, this is not the most intimate one. The most intimate would be yada, to know, as we saw with Adam and Eve back in chapter 4, and we've seen other situations. So this is uh, simply a, a sexual encounter without the sense of intimacy that yada implies. So one of the people might have lain with your wife, and you would have brought guilt upon us. Notice here it's suggesting that it has never happened, even though we're told they've been there for a long time. Um, and we don't know why it didn't happen. It could easily have happened. Um, maybe it, in fact, has happened, but we haven't heard about it. Uh, the word for brought guilt, asham, here is also only here in Genesis, but it's frequent in Leviticus. And as Wenham notes, most frequently it denotes the guilt offering, one of the most costly sacrifices demanded for serious sins such as adultery. But of course, Abimelech wouldn't have known about that. Abimelech doesn't know Leviticus, and obviously we have no reason he knows anything about Yahweh or anything about Torah. Um, so that's more for the audience here. So our story ends very differently than the others. Uh, we saw in the Egyptian story here that Pharaoh sends him away with treasure. Uh, he gives him sheep and oxen and male donkeys and male and female slaves and female donkeys and camels and, of course, Hagar as well, and then sends him away. And then, as I already noted, Abimelech gave uh, Abraham a thousand pieces of silver, which gave him a nice uh, pool of money to buy Machpelah, the burial place from the Hittites, for the extravagant amount that they demanded. But here, Isaac is not given anything, but he's also not sent away. Um, so there's no sense of reward, no sense of a need for exoneration, no sense of a need to clear away the guilt with a payment, but we hear this. Um, so Abimelech warned all the people, or literally commanded, whoever touches this man or his wife shall be put to death. And what an irony is that, is that Isaac had perhaps an unfounded fear uh, that if he admitted that Rebecca was his woman, uh, that his life was at risk. But now, because uh, it is his woman, Abimelech puts everyone else's life at risk if they even touch um, this man or his woman. Um, using a word God there for in the previous wife sister stories, but with a different purpose. It doesn't necessarily imply sexual touching. And shall be put to death, or literally die, yes, die. So why do we think the difference is here? Why does this end so peacefully, allowing Isaac and Rebekah to stay there, but under this royal uh, warning against anybody uh, locally to touch? Although how they all hear about this, how this proclamation is made, uh, we are not told. Uh, one of the reasons is, as we've been seeing, and we look at the key words, we can see the rest of it, is that there'll be another reason for Abimelech to send Isaac and Rebekah away, because he's become a wealthy farmer that threatens their local water supply. And so the story will take an interesting ecological turn next video. So stay with us, and we'll go to that next time. See you then. Bye-bye.